Well, good evening, Notchy Creek. Uh, Got to get, fill the, let's fill the choir loft up tonight. Come on, choir. Well, good evening, Notchy Creek. Let's all stand together and have a little talk with Jesus tonight. Sing it out. Come on, choir. I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. And then a little light from heaven filled my soul. It made my heart in love. Everybody say it. Amen. Amen. 
Well, before we begin tonight, let's just also, as we open in prayer, give the Lord something to praise the Lord for. Tell everybody what happened this morning at the end of the second morning service. I got saved. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Look at that. What a blessing that is. We're going to pray with her right now and open our service, and then the choir's going to sing some, and uh, let's just follow the Lord's leadership. We're so excited to see God on the move. Let's go with him. Wherever he's moving, let's go with him. Amen. Amen. God, we give you praise and glory. We're thankful for this profession of faith of this young lady. And Lord, we pray as a church we'd rally around her and her family, support her, and, and uh, train her up, and give her the devotions and the uh, support she needs to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray you'd put a edge of protection around her and bless her. Now, Lord, we commit this time of worship and celebration to you, and we give you praise and glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody say it. Amen. 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 Brother Buck.
How many of you are looking forward to seeing the Lord Jesus face to face? What a day, glorious day that's going to be. Let's remain standing as we sing it. said amen thank you please be seated miss verna come on bring bring a what the lord's laid on your heart tonight looks like i got the words right up here in front of me it looks like a good one church and I desire your prayers tonight. God is good. He's been so good to me. Cross 
would not get heavy, or the hills would not be hard to climb. He never offered victories without fighting, but he said help would always come in time. Just remember when you're standing in the valley of decision. And the adversary says, yeah, just hold on, our God will show up, and he'll take you through the fire again. Oh, I know within myself that I would surely perish, but if I trust the hand of God, you shield the flames again, again. He never promised that the cross would not get heavy. And the hills would not be hard to climb. He never offered victories without fighting. But he said, oh, good Just remember when you stand in the valley of decision. Well, here's the reality. Some of you and some of our church families in the middle of a fire. Sherry's going to begin to play on the organ, and what I'd like us to do is just have a time of prayer. Maybe you're here today and want somebody to pray with you. I'm going to ask Doug when he gets through telling his wife how precious she is, because she is, to come down here. Some of you deacons, if you don't mind, come down here. Now, we're not going to get in your way, but we're just going to commit these folks to prayer. You may be in the midst of a fire. Some of our church family is in the midst of fire with physical and all sorts of other needs. So this altar will be open for you to come pray. These deacons are happy to pray with you. You may want to pray with them. But if, why don't you just bow your heads in a word of prayer and begin to come on down and find a place to pray. And let's just unite in prayer for all of those in our church family that are in the fire because we know God is in the fire with us right now. Would you come and pray? If you want to pray by yourself, we'll certainly allow you that opportunity and privilege. It's your time.
Folks, continuing to pray, let's sing together. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Father, we pray right now for the grace to trust you more. May it be said that we have stood faithful in these days. And Lord, we know you have been so, so very good to us, and we're thankful. We pray thy will be done in the balance of the time you've given us to be in your house tonight. And we give you praise and glory. And it's in Jesus' name we've prayed, and everybody say it. Amen. 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 Thank you, Miss Sherry. Be finding the book of Jude. You can turn to whatever chapter in the book of Jude you want to. <laughs> Makes me no never mind. Somebody asked this morning about the importance of these apostate teachers. Are, Shane, do you really believe there are apostate teachers? Yes, I believe they're there. I believe they're here in the sense of in our world, in our own community. If anybody has a gospel contrary to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that is a false teacher. Now, how can you expect to follow a false teacher and end up in the right place? A little boy was sitting on his porch one day, and there was a car drove up and rolled down the window. And as he rolled down the window, he leaned out the window and yelled at the little boy and said, Hey, little boy, I'm curious if you can tell me where the post office is. The little boy said, Yes, sir. You go down two blocks, turn right, and it'll be at the corner. The gentleman said, oh, thank you, little boy, for helping me with that. The man said back, hey, little boy, I'm a preacher in town here, and I want you to know I want you to come to church, and if you'll come to church Sunday, I'll be sure to tell you how you know how to get to heaven. The little boy said, I'll not be there. The man was taken back. He said, well, why would you be that blunt about it? You're just not going to be there. He said, man, if you can't find a post office, I ain't trusting you to get me to heaven. <laughs> It's important we know where we're going Amen. because people are following us. Our children see what we do and what we don't do. In Jude, beginning in verse number 5, we see the first example of how God deals with apostate teachers. Now, we are paralleling that, if you will, because he said, I will therefore put them in remembrance Though you once knew this, watch this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believe not. You see, when you get wayward from the Lord and off course, you are not then on the same course you once were. And even, and I've given this example for many, many years now, but even if I just barely get off course here, over the course of my life, 
Look how far of a gap comes. The farther I go, the bigger the gap gets, and the more, of course, I am from there on. The first example that he deals with people when they abandon in the book of Jude here is those unfaithful Israelites. May this be said, when we sing that song that Sherry just played, I had no idea what she was going to play. That was not planned. I looked around literally before I walked on the stage and said, can you play something, please? Tis so sweet to what? Trust in Jesus. The chorus says that we have proved him o'er and o'er. Have we been a faithful steward and a faithful servant? The children of Israel were unfaithful, even though God had done so much for them. By the way, has God done anything for you? Amen. And we need to be found faithful. Now listen, I know we're not going to be perfect, but our goal ought to be to never let the Lord down because he's done so much for us. By the way, he's never let me down. Now, his will might have been a direction that I didn't realize, but he's never let me down and he's been with me always. If that makes sense, say amen. The fallen, I mean, the unfaithful uh, 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 Israelites in the Egypt, they're brought out of Egypt, but then that happened. But now we know in Judges chapter number two, in Judges chapter number two and verse number 11, we can see and, and, and parallel some of these things here because the Bible teaches us that of how this happened. And we need to understand that. In Judges chapter two, beginning in verse number 11, we see the example and down through, it really goes on through verse 23, but down through that, it gives the de definition of what happened of how they were in, uh, come out of Egypt, but then they were in God's hands. But guess what? They walked away from God and God God turned them over to their enemies and said, they walked away from me so you can have your way with them. Now, see, that's not the God that everybody likes to hear about. But the reality is God expects a little bit of loyalty too. I mean, it's not real. I'm not real smart. Don't say amen. All right? I'm not real. You're fighting it. Oh, me. I, the children of Israel did what? Evil in the sight of the Lord. I have done evil in the sight of the Lord, and you have too, but we need to keep sin on a short rope. But we live in a society that doesn't make sin a big deal. Sin is a big deal. Sin nailed Jesus to the cross. Sin made a, 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 a payment uh, or a debt that I couldn't pay. Therefore, the payment took the blood of Jesus because without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sin. Sin is always a big deal even if we don't think it's a big deal. Look in verse number 6 back in Jude. Not only do we see in verse 5 the unfaithful Israelites, in verse number 6 we see the fallen angels. Uh, God took it serious when they decided to have a little revolt in heaven one day too. The Bible says in verse number 6, the angels which kept not their first estate. Everybody understands that. It was not God's perfect plan for any of those angels even as messengers. I ain't going to worship angels and you shouldn't either. But it was not the perfect plan for them to lose their first estate. They did that through choice. By the way, you had a choice tonight to be in God's house or to do something else. You had a choice to be faithful to God's house or not. You had a choice to do all sorts of things this week. I had a choice to eat healthy at lunch. <laughs> or not. I want you to know I had broccoli. Y'all got no faith in me, did you? No. Huh? Did you, give somebody you put enough melted cheese and butter on something, it's good, man. <laughs> oh, no, hey, we all got choices every day. Verse 6, fallen angels. Isaiah chapter number 14, verses 12, 13, and 14. In Isaiah 14, uh, we see the story of what happened in, the, uh, uh, in heaven before Genesis 1-1, when the angels rebelled in heaven. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which thou did weaken the nation? By the way, his job is still to weaken the nations, and he is doing a great job of it. In verse number 13 and 14, we'll read them all. In verse 13, it goes on and says, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God and I will set upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. You see, that's what his plan, verse uh, 14, that's what his plan always is, is to exalt himself and I will ascend, uh, ascend above the heights of the clouds and I will be like the most high. And God said, no, I don't think so. Pack up and get out. Now that's me in the slang, but they were cast out because they wanted to be equal to God and be God. 
See, we see that God deals in Jude right here with all of these folks in Jude chapter, uh, verse number one, or verse number five. It says that about the unfaithful Israelites. In verse number six, God deals with the angels that thought they could rebel. Look in verse number seven. There was a group in a place called Sodom and Gomorrah. In verse number seven, it says, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner. What about that? Giving themselves over to fornication. Uh, our society is sex saturated. Amen. Our children are exposed to things that they ought not be exposed to. By the way, our children are exposed to things that adults ought not be exposed to. Amen. And then they look at us. Listen, and I'm part of that generation, that post hippie free love generation, so to speak, born in 1970s. Appreciate that. You must have meant the 80s. No. He said, I wasn't born in the 70s. Just means he can't do math. Amen. <laughs> yeah, hey, I was born in the 70s right after that, but guess what? I grew up in a promiscuous age too. Yeah. But it was kind of not talked about a whole lot because it wasn't as bad as what was being promoted in the 60s. So therefore, if you did certain things, it wasn't considered that bad. Yeah. That bad is still bad in God's eyes. Yeah. I grew up in that age. And all of us here have been guilty. By the way, you know, you, you ever think you're real good? Most of the, all the men in here that have any red blood in them at all probably battled this one. He that looks after a woman with lust has already committed adultery in his heart. You see, we battle that as men. But even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, they gave themselves over to fornication. Do you know that word's not used a whole lot in churches? That's not a popular topic to talk about. Don't. Commit fornication. We don't hear things like don't commit adultery. Those are still things that matter to God because he said don't do them. If that makes sense, say amen. amen. And going after strange flesh. They're set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal flame. See, Jude is reminding us when we get off course with God, bad things happen. In verse 5, he's reminding us God didn't take it lightly when the unfaithful Israelites did it. God didn't take it lightly when the angels did it in heaven. And God didn't take it lightly when a whole city was given over to their sexual immorality and their lust one for the other, so much so that the men burned within themselves and they wanted each other. You don't believe that? Well, the Bible talks about that. And the Bible gives us that. In the 19th chapter of the book of Genesis, it talks about this. There's a much longer chapter, but in verse number 23, the sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Zoar. Verse 24 goes on and says, and we'll read also into verse 25, the Lord reigned upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty serious to me. Yeah. Verse 25 says this, verse 25, and overthrew those cities and all the plain. Uh, by the way, when God gets ready to overthrow this nation, he will not have any problem. There will not be an army. There will not be a people. There will not be a resistance movement strong enough. And that's true with any nation, any power uh, around the world today. When you buck God long enough, don't be deceived. God will not be mocked. So God's just reminding us here in Jude. Why is this important? Because we talked about false teachers and things this morning during this great falling away. Now look in verse number eight, and then we're done. In verse number eight of Jude, here's what I think you need to catch this. Notice this. I want to give you the traits. If you're a follower of somebody and they hold these type doctrines, these type attitudes, I remind you, Jesus gave us some attitude and called them the be attitudes because that's how he needed us to be and calls us to be. But if you see someone exhibiting these, then I would have my spiritual antenna up about whether or not I'm really going to listen to anything they have to say, no matter if they call themselves pastor, preacher, teacher, or anything else. You still with me? Say amen. amen. These filthy dreamers, first of all, I know it's one phrase, filthy dreamers defile the flesh. But notice that. Let's break that down. Filthy dreamers. Now, we need to understand that the Bible talks about man's heart and every what? Imagination is set to do evil. We need to realize, what are your dreams? Well, do you, I mean, when you make a spiritual, uh, when you sit down and say in five years from now and you make a goal, for some of you it may be to still be alive. 
you keep amen at the wrong time. And amen. For some of you, it may be to lose some weight. So I'm praying the Lord comes in four so that I don't have to lose weight to the fifth one. Amen. Yeah. For some of you, it may be to be able to retire and you've secured enough of your resources to make it to retirement. For some of you, it may be blah, blah, blah. When's the last time you said, in five years spiritually, I hope to be? When's the last time you made a spiritual goal? I want to make sure I hand out a thousand tracts between now and five years. I want to tell 50 people a year about Jesus. I want to invite 2,500 people to church. I want to be closer to the Lord than I've ever been, week by week by week by week. When's the last time you made spiritual goals? We make goals for everything else. And if you don't have goals, you'll always hit exactly what you didn't aim for. Filthy dreamers. You see, that's not where these false apostate folks fit. They are dreaming of all sorts of vile stuff. They have a dream of where America will be too. And let me just say this, it's in the sewer. Listen, it doesn't take much to pull people down. It doesn't take much to pull a nation down. We talked about the restraining force this morning. See, when God's people don't stand up for God's things then guess what? The devil will be pulling people down and they have filthy, disgusting dreams. You don't believe that? I believe they had dreams several years ago that they would do such things as redefine such sacred topics as marriage. I believe they, years ago, set out and said, we're going to make it acceptable for folks to be, now listen, don't pass out, swingers. Now, if you think that involves a swing set, ask Doug Alexander afterward, and he'll explain what that means. Amen. <laughs> huh? I didn't want any of you to think, well, what's wrong with a playground at the back of the church? Amen. <laughs> you know, I inherited a congregation one time in which some of the church leadership, a small country church, was devastated because some of the church leadership got off task. Yeah. And they had started going to hotels and they were switching partners. The church leadership and their spouses. That's still wrong. Yeah. Filthy dreamers. I believe they dreamed a long time ago that we'd go to movies and not have any problem at all when they use the Lord's name in vain. I believe they had, probably had some dreams. We'll get America to the point that people laugh at preachers, make fun of God, and we'll get it so lowered down and the standard so lowered down that guess what? Nothing will matter to anybody. I believe they had a dream that nobody will stand up for anything until all of a sudden all their dreams start to become true. False teachers are filthy dreamers. And you need to make sure you're following spiritual leadership, whether that's your, you as parents or, or being these people or you're following your own young people, you follow your parents. We need to make sure that we have dreams that are wholesome for where we want to be spiritually because when you anywhere Christ has ever been, anywhere the gospel has ever been received, the moral behavior went up. So when moral behavior is declining, that tells me the importance of Christ and the lives of the people of the community are lessening as well. Notice what it says next, that defile the flesh. Do you know Bible talks about ways to defile the flesh? It even talks about fornication and adultery. It talks about how you're sinning against your own self and you're hurting your own body and all those kind of things. But guess what? A filthy dreamer defiles the flesh. If you are following somebody that winks at sin and doesn't teach you that a holy life is not important. Now listen, not a perfected life. Nobody in here is perfect. Got two or three that think they are, but nobody in here is perfect. Next Sunday night's on pride. Amen. <laughs> but guess what? Nobody's perfect. But we also need to still be able to stand up and say, this is sin. This is sin. This is sin. Not because I don't like it, but because thus saith the Lord. Amen. Look at the next one after the comment. You still with me? Say amen. amen. They despise dominion. Some folks just have to be in charge, don't they? Yeah. They don't want the police to tell them how fast to go. They don't want the legislator to make a law that might infringe on their freedom. Let, look around us what's happening in our society. Everybody's worried about all their rights. Fewer and fewer people talk about their responsibilities. 
you, everybody wants this. Now listen, the old sports example I'd give is everybody wants to be Vanderbilt Monday through Friday, but then play like Alabama on Saturday. You see, we have responsibilities as citizens of, the, of heaven and ambassadors here. We have responsibilities. Yes, I have some great privileges of being a member of the family of God, but I have some responsibilities too. Your car in the parking lot tonight sets a great example of being faithful to God's house. Way to go. We have a responsibility to study God's Word. We have a responsibility to be on a pattern to grow in Jesus Christ. You see, there are those, though, that despise dominion. You ain't going to tell me what to do. Whether that's at school. Now, listen, I, 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 we've got teachers in here that would amen this. We've got folks in here that have seen. We wonder what's going on. Listen, don't fuss at schools because if you pick up a local paper, Whatever's going on in the local papers going on at school because everybody that's making news, good, bad, and indifferent, they're sending their kids to school. So if the community's gone to hell, don't expect the school not to. You're just blessed that we still have some Christian teachers that are in those settings. But they're fighting an uphill battle. Now, you still with me? Say amen. Despise dominion. Pastoral authority is challenged in every church just about people all the time trying to make sure that they're holding on to their little slice of a local church and oftentimes are in God's way because the leader, God's shepherd, can't shepherd the flock because the flock's always running away and doing things they ought not do. Amen. Amen. Now listen to me. That's not ugly. Do you know what shepherds in the, in, in, in the days of shepherding and maybe still today what they used to do? When a sheep kept running away, they broke its legs. It's like you turkey hunting, Jeff. He told me that story there. You need to ask him about that, but not unless you have a strong stomach. All right, now, we don't like dominion. We don't like anybody to have anything on us. The pastor asked us to start on time. We'll start two minutes late just to prove we ain't got to start on time. If the preacher says, let's switch up something and I feel led to do this, how dare he? That's in church. What about in the world? How many of you sped on the way here today? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> Isn't it funny? We, we think, we don't think that's a big deal. But really, God has allowed the local authorities to be in charge and give us dominion over that. And when you speed, you've said that authority doesn't matter to me. Now, preacher, that don't matter. That's just driving a car down the road. Okay, well, then tell me when it does matter, when authority can have authority, if authority can't have authority all the time. By the way, the opposite of authority is anarchy. So when you buck the speed limit and then your kids buck your authority, they learned how to buck your authority because you learned how to buck the authorities. And they said, look, Mom and Dad, I don't have to pay attention to what you said because you didn't pay attention to the people over you. I'm moving in case they see a red dot. Let me know. Hmm? You see, we don't take it that literal, but I'm going to challenge you to take it that literal. Authority is authority. But false teachers despise dominion. They don't like to be hemmed in. Look at the last one. Speak evil of dignities. Now, I want to clarify something. A dignity is not a dignitary. It's not what that is. It literally renders out majesty. Let me put it another way. They speak evil of the things of God. Now listen, this isn't about shame. I'll use Doug. <laughs> Doug is a man called of God and everybody say it. When you speak against God's man, God takes that serious. When you speak against God's church, God takes that serious. And it is important we understand when you speak against the things of God, that may be a sign that you're not in God's will and you may be a false teacher or at least one that's backslidden or an apostate. You see, God takes that serious. And just in verse 5, the unfaithful Israelite, verse 6, the fallen angels, and in verse number 7, then we see also Sodom and Gomorrah. When people rebel against God, you may not think it's a big deal, but my God still believes it's a big deal. And these are steps, I think, in verse number 8 that lead us there. Dreamers that defile the flesh. I love the word filthy there, filthy dreamers. They come up with more and more. About the time you think you've heard of everything as vile as it could be, what happens? 
something else comes along. And it's coming faster than it ever has. And because of technology, it gets distributed all around the world, broader and deeper and faster than ever before. Then there's those that despise dominion. And there's those that speak evil of the things of God. Hey, listen, I want to be, I want to help you not just find the post office. I want it to be said that the preaching of God's word from these lips can lead you safely home. What about your kids if they're following your leadership, mom and dad? What about Sunday school class if you're a teacher of a class? If they follow the teachings and they followed your biblical lifestyle and those things, would it be said that you are a filthy dreamer, a despiser of dominion, speaking evil of God's people and God's things and God's places? Or could it be said that person is ready and following the Lord Jesus Christ. So we looked at it this morning. Tonight, this was not what was planned until afternoon, and God just spoke, laid that on my heart. Let's give them what they need to be looking out for. I, you know, I, I, I'm not a mechanic. I'm not good at mechanicking and those kind of things. Uh, but here's what I know. There's gauges on my car. And when a gauge comes up, I do what y'all do. Get the manual out and figure out what's that light mean. Yeah. Right? Anybody got a car in here that's smarter than you? You do? Most of them now, if you don't put your seatbelt on, it dings. Let me interpret that. Put your seatbelt on, dummy. Yeah. Right? It's smarter than we are. And it tells you all these kind of things. We have a car right now that you, it slows down on its own as you get close to a car. Yeah. How on earth can I get back at that person that passed me if my car won't let me? <laughs> Stop me. I don't like that makes sense? Yeah. You see... We're in a day and age where we just need to be careful about our testimony and our witness. There's never been a time, encouragement as we close, that your light can shine brighter because I don't think it's ever been darker in our community. Therefore, you may only be a 40-watt Christian, but that 40 watts has put out a lot of light in total darkness. Some of you may think you're a halogen or an LED, and you may very well be, but let's shine the light for the glory of God. In this day and age, in these last days that I believe, I want you to look out. Just as those warning gauges in your car come on, I wanted to make sure I felt led to give you these in verse number 8 of what those false teachers and those false people might be trying to pull you to. So look out for them with the knowledge that just as God dealt with unfaithful Israel, fallen angels, and Sodom and Gomorrah, he'll deal with Shane when Shane abandons God or gets off course, and he'll deal with all those. If that makes sense, say Amen. amen. I want you to stand up, take somebody's hand beside you if you're sitting close to somebody. And uh, I want to lead you in a word of prayer right here. God's good when? All the time. I appreciate you so much. We're here to help you any way we can and minister to folks. And God has been so good. Uh, kudos, continue to invite people to church because people need God's word. We all need God's word. 187 or so in Sunday school today. We want to continue to see that climb because we want to minister to people because people are hurting and need Jesus. God, we give you praise and glory for all things and for your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, as we leave here in just a moment, help us to say it's been good to be in the house of God for we have been obedient to your voice. We're thankful for your holy word and Lord, thankful for biblical examples. We're not happy that other folks went through bad things or made bad choices, but help us to learn from them. And Lord, we know you dealt with an abandonment there as the children of Israel were unfaithful. So you just turned them over to their enemies. We know that you also dealt with the angels and Lucifer in heaven as they led the rebellion and conducted an open rebellion in heaven against you, and therefore they were kicked out of heaven. And Lord, we also know in Sodom and Gomorrah, the whole city was given over to things that's just unspeakable in so many levels and ways. Your word tells us enough to know that you took it seriously and you destroyed those cities. So, Lord, we put our lives before you today and ask you to speak to our hearts and speak to our lives. And, Lord, we beg for mercy. We plead with you just to be gracious to us as we confess our sin to you. And, Lord, help us to look out for these apostate teachers in these last days. The warning signs are there. Help us to look for those filthy dreamers that defile the flesh, those that absolutely refuse to fall under any kind of dominion of the government or church or anyone else. And, Lord, those that simply put, are just not where they need to be. Lord, I pray that you would continue to be with those that speak evil of dignities, the things of God. 
May we have our spiritual antennas up and look for these things so that we don't end up being deceived or follow the wrong things in these last days. To God be the glory for great things you have done, and we know great things you will do. We give you praise. Now give traveling safety as we leave here in just a few moments, and we thank you in advance. And it's in Jesus' name we've prayed. Amen. Would you sing with me? Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. And everybody say it. Amen. Tell three people you love them and God does too. Have a great night. May the Lord richly bless you. God loves you, Randall.